Hello. Before we begin, a quick note. The Boy to Sleep podcast relies on you and sponsors, which means you will hear a quick advertisement before the beginning of tonight's episode. While the podcast is free, you are welcome to subscribe for just $2.99 per month, which supports the creation of this podcast and gives you an ad-free listening experience. Simply click the link in the show notes from your podcast app. Rest easy. Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from Memoirs of a Revolutionist. Written by Peter Kropotkin and published in 1906. This story is the author's autobiography, as well as being his most well-known work. My name is Teddy, and I aim to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. For those new to the podcast, it started from my own struggles with sleep. I wanted to create a resource for others facing similar challenges, and I'm so grateful for the amazing community we've built together. This podcast is self-made and self-produced which is why you'll hear a short ad at the beginning of each episode. These ads, along with support from subscribers and patrons, enable me to keep delivering this podcast for free to those who need it. Thank you to everyone who shared their words of gratitude with me during the week, whether through the website or their podcast app. Your messages mean the world to me. A special thank you to new subscribers via Spotify for Podcasters and all existing subscribers and Patreon sponsors. Your support is invaluable. Without your support, this wouldn't be possible. My goal is to keep this podcast free and accessible to everyone. This is why you hear that quick ad at the beginning of each episode. It helps generate financial support for the creation of the podcast. If you find the podcast beneficial and would like to support it, there are a few ways you can contribute. Follow the podcast in your app and leave a comment. You can of course become a subscriber for $2.99 per month. This also removes the Spotify ads and supports the episode creation. If subscribing isn't possible, an easy way to help is simply by leaving a review and rating in your podcast app. Even one sentence really helps out. If you would like to say hello, you can always connect with me at theboytosleep.com website. Sharing the podcast with a friend who may need it is also a fantastic way to show your appreciation while helping others. Your support in spreading the word is the greatest compliment I can receive. In the meantime, lie back, relax and enjoy the readings. Memoirs of a Revolutionist by Peter Kropotkin with a preface by George Brands and a preface to this edition by Peter Kropotkin dealing with events in Russia up to 1906. This book would probably not have been written for some time to come, were it not for the kind invitation and the most friendly encouragement of the editor and the publisher of the Atlantic Monthly to write it for a serial publication in their review. I feel it a pleasant duty to acknowledge here my very best thanks both for the hospitality that was offered to me 
and for the friendly pressure that was exercised in order to induce me to undertake this work. It was published in the Atlantic Monthly, September 1898 to September 1899, under the title of Autobiography of a Revolutionist. Preparing it now for publication in book form, I have considerably added to the original text in the portions relating to my youth and my stay in Siberia, and especially in the sixth part in which I have narrated my life in Western Europe. Preface The autobiographies which we owe to great minds have in former times generally been of one of three types. So far I went astray, thus I found the true path, St. Augustine. Or so bad was I, but who dares to consider himself better, Rousseau. This is the way a genius has slowly been evolved from within and by favourable surroundings. In these forms of self-representation, the author is thus mainly preoccupied with himself. In the 19th century, the autobiographies of men of mark are more often shaped on lines such as these. So full of talent and attractive was I, such appreciation and admiration I won. A life lived once more in reminiscence. Or I was full of talent and worthy of being loved, but yet I was unappreciated. And these were the hard struggles I went through before I won the crown of fame. Hans Christian Andersen. The Tale of a Life. The main preoccupation of the writer in these two classes of life records is consequently with what his fellow men have thought of him and said about him. The author of the autobiography before us is not preoccupied with his own capacities and consequently describes no struggle to gain recognition. Still less does he care for the opinions of his fellow men about himself. What others have thought of him, he dismisses with a single word. There is in this work no gazing upon one's own image. The author is not one of those who willingly speak of themselves. When he does so, it is reluctantly and with a certain shyness. There is here no confession that divulges the inner self, no sentimentality and no cynicism. The author speaks neither of his sins nor of his virtues. He enters into no vulgar intimacy with his reader. He does not say when he fell in love, and he touches so little upon his relations with the other gender, that he even omits to mention his marriage, and it is only incidentally we learn that he is married at all, that he is a father and a very loving one. He finds time to mention just once in the rapid review of the last 16 years of his life. He is more anxious to give the psychology of his contemporaries than of himself, and one finds in his book The Psychology of Russia, the official Russia and the masses underneath. Russia struggling forward and Russia stagnant. He strives to tell the story of his contemporaries rather than his own, and consequently the record of his life contains the history of Russia during his lifetime, as well as that of the labour movement in Europe during the last half century. When he plunges into his own inner world, we see the outer world reflected in it. There is nevertheless in this book an effect such as Gauti aimed in the dish tongue and Vahit, the representation of how a remarkable mind has been shaped, and in analogy with the confessions of St. Augustine, we have the story of an inner crisis which corresponds with what in olden times was called conversion. In fact, this inner crisis is the turning point and the core of the book. There are at this moment only two great Russians who think for the Russian people and whose thoughts belong to mankind. 
Leo Tolstoy and Peter Kropotkin. Tolstoy has often told us in poetical shape parts of his life. Kropotkin gives us here, for the first time, without any poetical recasting, a rapid survey of his whole career. However radically different these two men are, there is one parallel which can be drawn between the lives and the views on life of both. Tolstoy is an artist. Kropotkin is a man of science. But there came a period in the career of each of them when neither could find peace in continuing the work to which he had brought great inborn capacities. Religious considerations led Tolstoy Social considerations led Kropotkin to abandon the paths they had first taken. Both are filled with love for mankind, and they are at one in the severe condemnation of the indifference, the thoughtlessness, the crudeness and brutality of the upper classes, as well as in the attraction they both feel towards the life of the downtrodden, and ill-used man of the people. Both see more cowardice than stupidity in the world. Both are idealists and both have the reformer's temperament. Both are peace-loving natures and Kropotkin is the more peaceful of the two. Although Tolstoy always preaches peace and condemns those who take right into their own hands and resort to force, while Kropotkin justifies such action and was on friendly terms with the terrorists. The point upon which they differ most is in their attitudes towards the intelligent, educated man, and towards science altogether. Tolstoy, in his religious passion, disdains and disparages the man equally with the thing, while Kropotkin holds both in high esteem although at the same time he condemns men of science for forgetting the people and the misery of the masses. Many a man and many a woman have accomplished a great life work without having led a great life. Many people are interesting, although their lives may have been quite insignificant and commonplace. Kropotkin's life is both great and interesting, in this volume will be found a combination of all the elements out of which an intensely eventful life is composed. Idol and tragedy, drama and romance. The childhood in Moscow and in the country. The portraits of his mother, sister and teachers. Of the old and trusty servants. Together with the many pictures of patriarchal life are done in such a masterly way that every heart will be touched by them. The landscapes, the story of the unusually intense love between the two brothers, all this is pure idol. Side by side there is, unhappily, plenty of sorrow and suffering. The harshness in the family life, the cruel treatment of the serfs, and the narrow-mindedness, and heartlessness which are the ruling stars of men's destinies. There is variety, and there are dramatic catastrophes. Life at court and life in prison, life in the highest Russian society, by the side of emperors and grand dukes, and life in poverty, with the working proletariat in London and in Switzerland. There are changes of costume, as in a drama, the chief actor having to appear during the day in fine dress in the winter palace, and in the evening in peasant's clothes in the suburbs, as a preacher of revolution. And there is, too, the sensational element that belongs to the novel. Although nobody could be simpler in tone and style than Kropotkin, Nevertheless, parts of his narrative, from the very nature of the events he has to tell, are more intensely exciting than anything in those novels, which aim only at being sensational. One reads with breathless interest the preparations for the escape from the hospital of the fortress of St. Paul and St. Peter, 
and the bold execution of the plan. Few men have moved, as Kropotkin did, in all layers of society. Few know all these layers, as he does. What a picture. Kropotkin, as a little boy with curled hair, in a fancy dress costume, standing by the Emperor Nicholas or running after the Emperor Alexander as his page, with the idea of protecting him. And then again, Kropotkin in a terrible prison, sending away the Grand Duke Nicholas or listening to the growing insanity of a peasant who is confined in a cell under his very feet. He has lived the life of the aristocrat and of the worker, He has been one of the Emperor's pages and a poverty-stricken writer. He has lived the life of the student, the officer, the man of science, the explorer of unknown lands, the administrator, and the hunted revolutionist. In exile, he has had at times to live upon bread and tea as a Russian peasant, and he has been exposed to espionage and assassination plots like a Russian emperor. Few men have had an equally wide field of experience. Just as Kropotkin is able, as a geologist, to survey prehistoric evolution for hundreds of thousands of years past, so too he has assimilated the whole historical evolution of his own times. To the literary and scientific education, which is one in the study and in the university, such as the knowledge of languages, bowels lettres, philosophy and higher mathematics, he added at an early stage of his life that education which is gained in the workshop, in the laboratory and in the open field, natural science, military science, fortification, knowledge of mechanical and industrial processes. His intellectual equipment is universal. What a must this active mind have suffered when he was reduced to the inactivity of prison life. What a test of endurance and what an exercise in stoicism. Kropotkin says somewhere that a morally developed personality must be at the foundation of every organisation. That applies to him. Life has made of him one of the cornerstones for that building of the future. The crisis in Kropotkin's life has two turning points which must be mentioned. He approaches his 30th year, the decisive year in a man's life. With heart and soul, he is a man of science. He has made a valuable scientific discovery He has found out that the maps of northern Asia are incorrect, that not only the old conceptions of the geography of Asia are wrong, but that the theories of Humboldt are also in contradiction with the facts. For more than two years, he has plunged into laborious research. Then suddenly on a certain day, the true relations of the facts flash upon him. He understands that the main lines of structure in Asia are not from north to south or from west to east, but from the southwest to the northeast. He submits his discovery to test. He applies it to numerous separated facts and it holds its ground. Thus he knew the joy of scientific revelation in its highest and purest form. He has felt how elevating is its action on the mind. Then comes the crisis. The thought that these joys are the lot of so few fills him now with sorrow. He asks himself whether he has the right to enjoy this knowledge alone for himself. He feels that there is a higher duty before him to do his part in bringing to the mass of the people the information already gained, rather than to work at making new discoveries. For my part, I do not think he was right. With such conceptions, Pasture would not have been the benefactor of mankind that he has been. After all, everything in the long run is to benefit of the mass of the people. 
I think that a man does the utmost for the well-being of all when he has given to the world the most intense production of which he is capable. But this fundamental notion is characteristic of Kropotkin. It contains his very essence. And this attitude of mind carries him farther. In Finland, where is he going to make a new scientific discovery? As he comes to the idea, which was hearsay at the time, that in prehistoric ages all northern Europe was buried under ice. He is so impressed with compassion for the poor, the suffering, who often know hunger in their struggle for bread, that he considers it is highest. Absolute duty to become a teacher and helper of the great working and destitute masses. Soon after that, a new world opens before him, the life of the working classes, and he learns from those whom he intends to teach. Five or six years later, this crisis appears in its second phase. It happens in Switzerland. Already during his first stay there, Kropotkin had abandoned the group of state socialists. From fear of an economical despotism, from hatred of centralization, from love for the freedom of the individual and the commune. Now, however, after his long imprisonment in Russia, during his second stay amidst the intelligent workers of West Switzerland, the conception which floated before his eyes of a new structure of society more distinctly dawns upon him in the shape of a society of federated associations cooperating in the same way as the railway companies or the postal departments of separate countries cooperate. He knows that he cannot dictate to the future the lines which it will have to follow. He is convinced that all must grow out of the constructive activity of the masses, but he compares for the sake of illustration the coming structure with the guilds and the mutual relations which existed in medieval times and were worked out from below. He does not believe in the distinction between leaders and led, but I must confess that I am old-fashioned enough to feel pleased when Kropotkin, by a slight inconsistency, says once in praise of a friend that he was a born leader of men. The author describes himself as a revolutionist, and he is surely quite right in doing so. But seldom have there been revolutionists so humane and mild. One feels astounded when, in alluding on one occasion to the possibility of an armed conflict with the Swiss police, there appears in his character the fighting instinct which exists in all of us. He cannot say precisely in this passage whether he and his friends felt a relief at being spared a fight, or a regret that the fight did not take place. This expression of feeling stands alone. He has never been an avenger, but always a martyr. He does not impose sacrifices upon others. He makes them himself. All his life he has done it, but in such a way that the sacrifice seems to have cost him nothing. So little does he make of it, and with all his energy he is so far from being vindictive, that of a disgusting prison doctor he only remarks, the less said of him, the better. He is a revolutionist without emphasis and without emblem, He laughs at the oaths and ceremonies with which conspirators bind themselves in dramas and operas. This man is simplicity personified. In character, he will bear comparison with any of the fighters for freedom in all lands. None have been more disinterested than he. None have loved mankind more than he does. But he would not permit me to say in the forefront of his book all the good that I think of him, and should I say it, my words would outrun the limits of a reasonable preface. George Brands When the first edition of this book 
was brought out at the end of 1899. It was evident to those who had followed the development of affairs in Russia that owing to the obstinacy of its rulers in refusing to make the necessary concessions in the way of political freedom, the country was rapidly drifting towards a violent revolution. But when everything seemed to be so calm on the surface, that when a few of us expressed this idea, we were generally told that we merely took our desires for realities. At the present moment, Russia is in full revolution. The old system is falling to pieces, and amidst its ruins, the new one is painfully making its way. Meanwhile, the defenders of the past are waging a war of extermination against the country, a war which may prolong their rule for a few additional months, but which raises at the same time the passions of the people to a pitch that is full of menaces and danger. Looked upon the light of present events, the early movements for freedom which are related in this book acquire a new meaning. They appear as the preparatory phrases of the great breakdown of a whole obsolete world, a breakdown which is sure to give a new life to nearly 150 million people, and to exercise at the same time a deep and favourable influence upon the march of progress in all Europe and Asia. It seems necessary, therefore, to complete the record of events given in this book by a rapid review of those which have taken place during the last seven years and were the immediate cause of the present revolution. The thirteen years of the reign of Alexander III in 1881 to 1894 were perhaps the gloomiest portion in the 19th century history of Russia. Reaction had been growing worse and worse during the last few years of the reign of his father, with the result that a terrible war had been waged against autocracy by the executive committee, which had inscribed on its banner political freedom. After the tragic death of Alexander II, his son considered it his duty to make no concessions whatever to the general demand of representative government, and a few weeks after his advent to the throne, he solemnly declared his intention of remaining an autocratic ruler of his empire. And then began a heavy, silent, crushing reaction against all the great, inspiring ideas of liberty, which our generation had lived through at the time of the liberation of the serfs, a reaction perhaps the more terrible on account of its not being accompanied by striking and revolting acts of violence, but slowly crushing down all the progressive reforms of Alexander II, and the very spirit that bred these reforms, and turning everything, including education, into tools of a general reaction. Sheer despair got hold of that generation of Russian intellectuals who had to live through that period. The few survivors of the executive committee laid down their arms, and there spread in Russian intellectual society that helpless despair, that loss of faith in the forces of the intellectual, that general invasion of commonplace vulgarity. True that Alexander III, since his advent to the throne, had vaguely understood the importance of several economic questions concerning the welfare of the peasants, and had included them in his program. But with the set of reactionary advisers whom he had summoned to his aid, and whom he retained throughout his reign, he could accomplish nothing serious. The reactionaries whom he trusted did not at all want to make those serious improvements in the conditions of the peasants, which he considered it the mission of autocracy to accomplish. And he would not call in other men, because he knew that they would require a limitation of the powers of autocracy, which he would not admit. When he died, a general feeling of relief went through Russia and the civilised world at large. Never had a Tsar 
ascended the throne under more favourable circumstances than Nicholas II. After these 13 years of reaction, the state of mind in Russia was such that if Nicholas II had only mentioned, in his Advent Manifesto, the intention of taking the advice of his country upon the great questions of inner policy, which required an immediate solution, he would have been received with open arms. The smallest concession would have been gladly accepted as an asset. In fact, the delegates of Zemstov assembled to greet him, asked him only, and this in the most submissive manner, to establish a closer intercourse between the emperor and the provincial representation of the land. But instead of accepting this modest invitation, Nicholas II read before the Zemsto representatives the insolent speech of reprimand, which had been written for him by Pobinovstov, and which expressed his intention of remaining an autocratic ruler of his subjects. A golden opportunity was thus lost. Distrust became now the dominating note in the relations between the nation and the Tsar, and it was striking to see how this distrust in one of those indescribable ways in which popular feelings develop rapidly spread from the Winter Palace to the remotest corners of Russia. The results of that distrust soon became apparent. The great strikes which broke out at St. Petersburg in 1895, at the time of the coronation of Nicholas II, gave a measure of the depth of discontent which was growing in the masses of the people. The seriousness of the discontent and the unity of action which this revealed were quite unsuspected. What an immense distance was covered since those times, of which I speak in this book, when we used to meet small groups of weavers in the Vyborg suburb of St. Petersburg, and asked them, with despair, if it really was impossible to induce their comrades to join in a strike, so as to obtain a reduction of the hours of labour, which were fourteen and sixteen at the time. Now the same working men combined all over St. Petersburg, and brought out their ranks such speakers and such organisers, as if they had been trade union hands for ages. Two years later, in 1897, there were serious disturbances in all the Russian universities, but when a second series of student disturbances began in 1901, they suddenly assumed a quite unexpected political significance. The students protested this time against a law passed by Nicholas II, who had ordered, again, on the advice of Podonovstov, that students implicated in academical disorders should be sent to Port Arthur as soldiers. Hundreds of them were treated accordingly. Formerly such a movement would have remained a university matter. Now it assumed a serious political character and stirred various classes of society. At Moscow, the working men supported the students in their street demonstrations and fought at their side against the police. At St. Petersburg, all sorts of people, including the workmen's organisations, joined in the street demonstrations and serious fighting took place in the streets. I have mentioned in this book how tragical was the position of our youth in the 70s and 80s on account of the fathers having abandoned entirely to their sons the terrible task of struggling against a powerful government. Now the fathers joined hands with the sons. The respectable society of authors issued a strongly worded protest. A venerated old member of the Council of the State did the same. Even the officers of the Cossacks of the bodyguard notified their unwillingness to carry on such police duties. In short, discontent was so general and so openly expressed that the Committee of Ministers, assuming for the first time since its foundation the role of a ministry, discussed the imperial order concerning the students and insisted upon and obtained 
its withdrawal. And that concludes tonight's reading. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this story, and if you're not quite tired yet, feel free to listen to another episode of the Boy to Sleep podcast. Until next time, good night.